John Elledge from The New Statesman and political consultant Giles Cunningham. And at nine, should Diane Abbott be allowed to stand as a Labour candidate at the next election? On your radio, on Global Player and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 7 o'clock, the shadow foreign secretary has told LBC the government must prove it has learnt lessons from Afghanistan in Sudan. Speaking on tonight with Andrew Marr, David Lammy says he has concerns other countries are doing better at getting people out rather than the UK. It's a very challenging and complicated environment. But of course, other countries have been able to get their nationals out and we commend the French who were able to get some UK nationals out as well. This is why I think it was right that we raised in the House questions about how uh, SCDO colleagues and ministers have learned from Afghanistan to ensure that the same mistakes are not being made again. Updating the MPs earlier, Africa Minister Andrew Mitchell described the situation as extremely grave. As many as 4,000 UK citizens are believed to be in the country where there is growing violence. A small number of British troops have arrived in Sudan to assess evacuation options. Armed Forces Minister James Heapy has told Andrew Marr the situation is very different in Khartoum to Kabul. Effectively, Kabul International Airport became the last point of safety in the whole of Afghanistan. And Khartoum, that's very different. The, Kabul in, the Khartoum International Airport is out of commission. There's a, there is indeed a military team in the east of the country in Port Sudan doing a reconnaissance there so that we can present to the Prime Minister all possible options for helping the British nationals who are in Sudan. The Health Secretary is bringing legal action against the Royal College of Nursing over its plans to strike next month. Steve Barclay says the NHS believes walkouts on the 2nd of May are unlawful. LBC's Westminster editor Ben Kentish says it's all rather technical. This is about trade union legislation that allows strike action to go ahead up to six months after members vote for it. Now, the Royal College of Nursing's ballot closed on the 2nd of November, so they believe that takes them up to the 2nd of May, the second day of their 48-hour strike next week. The government disagrees. The government is of the view, as I understand it, that the mandate for strike action actually expires at midnight the day before. The Labour leader says he utterly condemns Diane Abbott's comments about Jews. In a letter to The Observer, she claimed they don't suffer racism and compared prejudice they experience to that faced by Irish and traveller people. She's been suspended from the party pending an investigation. A Just Stop oil protester jailed for scaling a bridge on the Dartford crossing has criticised his sentence. Marcus Decker has spoken to LBC from his prison cell after being sentenced to two years and seven months for causing a public nuisance. He says the climate crisis should have been taken into account. It's a terrible thing to, to climb up a bridge, hold up all these people, uh, some some people, you know, miss funerals, and 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 I, I feel terrible about that, um, causing people pain, real pain. I really hope we can find ways to have a similar impact without that pain. But I'm certainly at a loss how to. A protest by Just Stop Oil caused gridlock in central London this morning for more than three hours. And Strictly Judge Len Goodman has been described as a beautiful man and a national treasure following his death at the age of 78. He'd been diagnosed with bone cancer and died on Saturday night. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed down two points at 79.12. The pound buys $1.24 and €1.12. LBC weather, rain clearing in the southeast to leave a dry and mostly clear night for much of the UK. Wintry showers for the far north of Scotland, a cold night with lows of minus four. Cold to start tomorrow with isolated showers in northern Scotland. Largely dry with sunshine further south with patchy cloud developing later, a high of 12 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Amelia Cox. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with Ian Dale.
Hello, a very good evening. Welcome to the programme. I'm Ian Dale, here with you till 10 o'clock as usual. Now, we're going to do something slightly unusual all this week at 7 o'clock. We're going to do an hour-long phone-in with each of the main political parties who are contesting the local elections. Now, there are no local elections in Scotland or Wales. It's just England. So we've got the Labour Party tomorrow. Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, Chancellor, will be coming in. On Wednesday, it's the Lib Dem Deputy Leader, Daisy Cooper. And on Thursday, the co-leader of the Green Party, Carl. Denia. But tonight, uh, we're joined in the studio by Greg Hans. He's the chairman of the Conservative Party. Um, fairly new to the job, was appointed um, after the departure of Nadim Zahawi. Uh, Greg, welcome. We'll come to calls in just a few moments' time. <coughs> by the way, if you want to phone Greg and ask a question, the number to call 0345 6060973. We're streaming this hour uh, live on Global Player as well, if you want to watch as well as listen. You can text your question to 84850 or say, Alexa, send a comment to LBC. Now, when you were appointed chairman of the party, did you feel as if you'd drawn the short straw because you knew that there were local elections looming, the polls looked pretty bad? Um, it was almost a bit of a suicide mission. No, it? quite the opposite, Ian. I am relishing doing the job. I've uh, really... I've been a member of the party for 37 years. I've represented the party at every level. I've been an elected student union officer. I've been a councillor. I've been a council group leader. I've been a parliamentary candidate. I've been a whip. I've been a minister, a member of the cabinet. So actually being made party chairman, I found, is both an honour, a privilege, and an immensely exciting job. I love campaigning up and down the country, uh, in my own constituency, um, going on representing the party, going head to head with Labour, the Lib Dems, the Nats. It's I'm really enjoying it. It is about damage limitation, though. This time, no, isn't it? no, I totally because disagree. well. I mean, you lost a thousand. When these seats were last fought in 2019, uh, the Conservatives lost a thousand seats. Now, you're not going to sit there and tell me, yes, we expect to lose another thousand, I, I, I'm sure. But there's always a bit of expectation management in these things, isn't there? I mean, you don't expect to gain seats, do you? Well, look, I, I think my councillors, my uh, council candidates, my party activists are really fired up. They're really up for this election. The mood amongst uh, them, those who are representing really well-run conservative councils on the ground uh, is really strong and positive. Um, but the independent uh, assessments from the academics, uh, Rallings and Thrasher, John Curtis, all those people that you'll know who are the world's, uh, the country's experts on uh, councils and council elections are predicting the Conservative Party will lose a thousand seats. Um, but I find uh, my activists, my councillors, candidates are quite, are quite buoyant uh, and in good mood. What, what's the most challenging issue at the moment? Because I would have thought it would be cost of living, because I mean, that, that's affecting everybody. What can local councils do to alleviate that subject for people? Well, I think uh, uh, charging lower council tax, for example, Conservative councils charge you £80 less on Band D council tax while still providing better services. Conservative councils fill more potholes than Labour and Lib Dem councils combined, better recycling, lower crime rates in Conservative councils. So Conservative councils cost you less, deliver better services. Of course, the government, uh, you're right, cost of living is, is the number one issue at the moment. That's why uh, the Five priorities, halving inflation, creating well, that's growth, not going very well, is reducing it? debt. That's not going very well. Reducing debt, that's not it's, going very well. It, it's, it's work in progress on inflation. Of course, we'd like inflation to be lower. Uh, we have done things over the winter, like we paid half of people's energy bills over the winter. That has been a big part of making cost of living e easier for people. But of course, inflation remains a very high priority. Well, let's go through those. So what, what was the, the second one? Reducing debt, that's not going very that's well either, is it? So increasing growth and reducing debt. Well, increasing growth, that's not going very well. Reducing debt isn't going very well. What's, well, the, what's the fourth one? Uh, the fourth one is stopping the boats. That's not going very and well. And the fifth one is reducing <laughs> hospital waiting lists. That's not going very well at all. Well, so you're not making much progress on any of those, uh, are you? But they're, they're all designed to be quite tough challenges and they're designed to uh, be a stretch. Um, the Prime Minister is dedicated to delivering on those are his priorities, that the people's priorities, the country's priorities. That's what people want to see us getting on with. That is what we are getting on with. But nobody pretended that meeting those pri five priorities was going to be easy. Do you not think that, though, you're, you're running out of electoral rope there? Because an election has to be called within roughly the next 18 months. And if, if you haven't shown signs of real progress on all of those, say, within the next six months, you're going to run out of time. 
Well, let, let's see. I mean, the uh, I think the uh, it, it's too early to pass uh, judgment. Uh, those are the priorities. I think the people want to see uh, good, uh, competent government. That's what you get from Rishi Sunak, uh, from his team, from the cabinet, is good, competent delivery uh, and making sure those people's priorities are going to be met. That's what we're working on. But uh, isn't that delivery, I mean, let's assume you're right on that, but isn't that being undermined by the likes of Gavin William going, Nadim Zahawi going, and of course last week, Dominic Raab, just when the Prime Minister seems to be getting a grip of things, something like that happens to throw him off, off pitch. Well, look, I don't think he has been thrown off pitch. And I think uh, we've seen uh, today with the uh, big uh, business summit that the government has been doing, uh, big government efforts going into uh, evacuating uh, people from Sudan in terms of our diplomatic presence. There's a lot that government has been delivering on uh, in the last few days, as has been the case earlier this year. When you look at what uh, Rishi Sunak has delivered on, he's delivered on the Windsor Protocol, the Australia and US uh, Defence Alliance, uh, membership of the CPTPP uh, free trade area. These are all major, major government achievements uh, so far this year. Um, let me read this text out from Robbie in Chelmsford, who says, I voted Conservative in the last two elections, but Boris repulsed me. Trust terrified me. Sunak has been better, but d is disappointing me. I'm considering joining the Lib Dems to beat my local Tories. Change my mind. Well, uh, I think uh, Chelmsford is a case in point. Uh, we've got a brilliant uh, member of parliament in Vicky Ford who represents Chelmsford in an incredibly good way. I would say Conservatives, we have delivered, we've delivered record uh, numbers of uh, doctors, uh, 50,000 more nurses by next year, 38,000 more doctors. We are making uh, those big commitments to public there, services. There are fewer doctors now than there were before the 2015 election. No, the, the, the number of doctors has risen by 38,000. Uh, the number of nurses will go up by 50,000 by next year. So those are really big inputs into the NHS. We're now obviously uh, trying to work off the NHS backlog. Uh, that's been made more difficult by the strikes, but we are moving forward. The Prime Minister, Steve Barclay, absolutely dedicated to that. The Lib Dems, uh, by contrast, would put Keir Starmer into Downing Street. Uh, and we've seen that uh, Keir Starmer, in kind of terms of his soft attitude on things like crime, I think would not be good for the country. And the Lib Dems would put him in, in Downing Street. Um, I, I got an email from you today, which is coincidental, given that we're, we're here this evening. Um, it, it's an email that anyone can get up, signed up to uh, off the Conservative Party website. And it, it's a pretty vicious attack on Keir Starmer being soft on crime. Is, it, is this a direct result of Labour's adverts accusing Rishi Sunak of being exactly the same? Um, because... If you're just responding to Labour attack ads, what does that say? No, it isn't. Um, this is different uh, because these use the words, uh, the, the Labour attack ads on Rishi Sunak are invented, uh, invented uh, positions that uh, Rishi Sunak uh, supposedly has. Um, these are actually quoting, this particular email, I'm looking in front of you, actually quotes the words not of a conservative person, but actually of Emily Thornberry, uh, the shadow attorney general, her comments she made about the Crown Prosecution Service under Keir Starmer, that it was effectively soft on uh, rapists, uh, soft on child abuse, and wanted tougher action to defend victims. So this is actually us quoting Labour's own shadow attorney general talking about um, um, Sir Keir Starmer's soft approach on crime. Um, you've, I don't know if this is part of this press release, but um, you've sent out a press release saying Labour have a choice this week to back our bill or back people smugglers, but they won't back our bill because the truth is Labour don't want to stop the boats. I mean, that's not true, is it? And it, it echoes what Rishi Sunak said to Keir Starmer at PMQs a few weeks ago when he said that Keir Starmer was the friend of the people smugglers, which I thought was a bit of a new low in British politics. And you're kind of echoing that with that quote, because of course Labour will say they don't back people smugglers. Of course they want to stop the boats, as any right-minded person would. But I don't think Labour have proposed anything themselves to actually try and stop the boats. So we have the legislation... Well, they propose safe routes, which you continue to resist. Well, uh, OK, but we have proposed this legislation, which the House of Commons has been voting on, Ian, for the last couple of months. Virtually every vote that there has been, Labour has opposed the government, tried to stop the boats legislation. We think it is really important. We think it's important to take action on people smugglers. That's what the legislation is all about. Labour is opposing us taking that because action. Because they disagree with it. 
That doesn't mean to say they don't want to stop the uh, votes, okay. does it? Okay, but it's they're opposing taking the tough action on people smugglers. That is why. Fine. That and, is and have why that debate in a reasonable way, rather action. than descend into the gutter with these kind of comments. Well, I don't know. It's pointing out that Labour have been voting against the legislation. The legislation enables us to take tough action on people smugglers. Therefore, I think it's perfectly legitimate to point out that Labour have voted against the tough action on people smugglers, therefore effectively being on the side of people smugglers. I mean, it seems to me, so th th these are the opening salvos in an 18-month-long election campaign. It's going to get pretty down and dirty, isn't it? Well, no, I disagree. I think that email, for example, quote, not a Conservative person talking about Sir Keir Starmer, but a Labour person. This is their own, if you like, internal commentary on Sir Keir Starmer being soft on crime. Uh, the British people think, I think, that Sir Keir Starmer is soft on crime. That is what we are pointing out. Uh, it's pointing out factually in terms of the bonus he, legislation he, that Labour is voting against. Of public prosecutions. He will know be able to point to countless occasions where he was very tough on Well, crime. this is actually Emily Thornberry at the time saying that the Crown Prosecution Service, which was led by Sir Keir Starmer, uh, was failing uh, rape victims and failing victims of sexual abuse. And that Crown Prosecution Service was, of course, led by the Director of Public Prosecution mm. at the time, Sir Keir Starmer. But he isn't now. Uh, you've been in government now for 13 years. Labour's attack ads point out to the fact that you haven't been tough on these people either. Well I, well, I think that that's, we're putting through more legislation now, uh, which has been continually opposed by Labour. All of these criminal justice bills over the last 13 years, Ian, have been opposed by Labour, fought by Labour every time. Uh, we have been putting forward the tougher legislation for the tougher action. We're getting more police on the streets in London, for example, than our record number of police officers in London. We are taking the action to make sure the police have got the resources they need and make sure they have the legislation in place, which Labour has been opposing. Are a lot of your councillors rather annoyed that a lot of maybe their good work is being thrown off beam by the noises from the national scene um, where they think, well, we don't stand a... Ho and this is nothing new in local elections. It's happened all throughout our adult lives, I guess. But it must be incredibly frustrating for councillors on a local level to... I mean, all the Dominic Raab stuff last week, for instance, or whatever work they're doing, all people are talking about is that. Well, I, I'm not sure about that, Ian. Actually, I was in Elmbridge, uh, which is uh, Dominic's uh, local authority area, uh, just on Friday, uh, talking to uh, the council candidates, uh, John Cope, who's the uh, leader of the council, the leader of the Conservative group on the council, and they were quite uh, positive about it. They were quite positive about um, the message uh, that they were sending out and the good work that's been done by Conservative councillors trying to regain control of that council. As a former councillor myself, as a council group leader myself, you know, I'm familiar with how these things work. Uh, but nonetheless, I find my councillors and council candidates and group leaders uh, quite uh, in quite good heart going into this. OK, life. right. We have lots of time for calls. Uh, we've got lots on the board already. If you'd like to contribute to the programme, 0345 6060 973. 17 minutes past seven. This is LBC.
20 past seven on LBC. Uh, Greg Hans, the chairman of the Conservative Party, is here to take your calls. Let's go to David in Sutton Caulfield. Hello, David. Hi there. Hi, Greg. Um, I, I heard everything you had to say, and, and I understand why you're doing it. I mean, I personally don't believe a word of it, but, you know, I understand why you do it. But on LBC eight days ago, you said that public services were in great shape. And I'd just like to know, um, what, how are you measuring that? What's your evidence for that? Yeah, thanks, David. Thank you very much indeed for that question. And uh, different public services will be measured in, in different ways. Uh, for example, I mentioned earlier councils, uh, councils which uh, produce better public services at a lower rate of council tax are disproportionately conservative councils. I think for the other public services, is a question, uh, sometimes it's not just a question of the sort of the number of people, the resources that go in. Uh, but I mentioned that by next year, there'll be 50,000 extra nurses, 38,000 extra doctors this year already uh, in the NHS. Um, so it's not just that, but also the outcomes. We're obviously inherited quite a operations backlog uh, from during the COVID times. That is the waiting list backlog we're working off. We're very, very focused on that. So that would be one of the key metrics. Um, that Rishi Sunak has laid out as one of the five priorities. I think on schools, it's a question also of improving exam results. It'll be interesting this year with the um, effectively sort of coming out of the pandemic, that comparator with previous years. So it would depend, the metric, I think, would depend public service to public service. You cannot seriously sit there and look me in the eye and say that health service is in great shape. It's in crisis at the moment. Well, it's clearly... Uh, coming out of the pandemic with the backlog has not been easy, uh, but in terms of the government resources going in, government resources going into the NHS uh, are, are massively up on what they were in 2010. The number of people operating the NHS, uh, doctors, uh, nurses, uh, other positions has also gone up uh, considerably it, as well. But it is a challenge it, at the it moment. It hasn't though, Ola. I mean, GPs, for example, there are fewer GPs now than there were in 2015. That is a fact. Well, uh, it was also a big challenge on GP services, again, sort of coming out of the pandemic. We're working very hard. We are improving in many ways the diagnostic centres, for example, that we've set up, uh, additional resources that have been going into the NHS. The NHS, of course, did an amazing job for the country during the pandemic itself. We must never forget. I mean, there's a number of really, really important outcomes from the but NHS. But if all of this extra money is going in, and I, it, it clearly is, I mean, you just have to consult the National Audit Office for that. Then something is going wrong in the management of it because the outcomes are not where they ought to be. So something is going wrong somewhere because, I mean, I get people phoning in all the time wanting to praise the NHS, but then giving an example of where it's actually failed them or their family. Now, you're never going to be successful in everything that you do. It stands to reason anything to do with health, health is a risk. But it seems to me that the NHS is in a state now partly because so many doctors and nurses are leaving the NHS. Well, as and that, that's, that was a problem that should have been sorted out before now. Well, uh, we are bringing more doctors, uh, more nurses into the NHS. Um, I think people, of course, uh, their experience of the NHS... Uh, um, in terms of things like waiting lists, uh, has not been great coming out of the pandemic. But that is why we put the resources in, extra resources into social care as well, uh, to make sure that we get the right NHS outcomes for people. That is, uh, we're working very, very hard on that. Steve Barclay, the health secretary, the prime minister, giving his personal attention to it as well. Which public service do you think is performing best of all of them? Well, as I say, it would be different metrics uh, for different public services. Uh, I think the uh, number of police officers is uh, looking very, very healthy. Uh, in London, for example, we do have a record number of police officers now in the Metropolitan Police. So you're just playing catch-up because you, you, you locked 20,000 no, of them it, it, No, it is an all-time high. Uh, that is not playing catch-up. That is actually at an all-time high. It will depend on which public service. I think in terms of some of the uh, schools, uh, again, uh, the uh, the impact that uh, the government schools reforms have had uh, over the last uh, 13 years has been a very positive impact. Right, let's go to Ben in Keston. Hello, Ben. Um, hi, I'm a young person who's sort of... Um, the next election, it'll be the first election where I've been able to vote. Um, and I'm just wondering why I should trust um, the sort of the Conservative government to um, lead the country forward when it seems so apparent that um, our country is in one of the worst states it's been in for a significant number of years. 
What, why do you say that, Ben? Um, I mean, if you look at sort of um, Rishi Sunak's sort of um, like five pledges, I mean, none of them are going anywhere to being met. I mean, we have um, rising inflation again. We're predicted to have the worst economic performance in the G20, in, which includes sort of sanctions hit Russia. Um, in terms of reducing debt, we have the highest debt in 60 years. In terms of cutting waiting lists, we have a record 7 million people waiting for hospital treatment. And in terms of stopping the boat, I mean, we have um, a, a backlog eight times higher than it was um, in 2010. And um, the only solution that the Conservative government has come up with is to flout um, international law and to um, go against a refugee convention that um, well, we've that... helped to set up. Okay. OK, Ben. Well, you've got a young person there, clearly engaged in politics. Um, what can you do to persuade him that things, as Tony Blair used to say, will get better? Well, I think it's uh, not right. Uh, ben, thank you for the question. And I think, I mean, I before I became Conservative Party chairman, which is, uh, keeps me in this country a lot, um, but I was doing jobs for many years like the trade minister and going abroad, uh, people underestimate... Uh, how well Britain is regarded by in our international partners, international populations. Britain is almost always regarded better abroad than sometimes the critique at home. Even, might even be. when we threaten to break international law. Well, uh, I think people have great respect uh, for the UK. Uh, they know that our economy was actually the fastest growing the last two years, in 2021 and 2022, uh, in the G7. Uh, people know that our uh, pandemic response, we were the fastest into the vaccination uh, in terms of the AstraZeneca vaccination, everything else that we did. We're very, very well regarded over abroad. That, that's why we were welcomed into the CPTPP free trade area as the first country to join CPTPP. That's why the Prime Minister has negotiated as joining the AUKUS uh, Defence Alliance. Now, these are all cases where the UK is actually really well regarded uh, overseas. So I don't accept the premise that the UK but is if, in a bad place internationally. If, if you put all of those things together that Ben said there, you, you know as well as I do that the electorate very rarely reward a political party for doing well in the past. They just want to see signs of competence. But what they want to know, or what they want to have confidence in, is that you're going to do well by them in the future. And at the moment, I, I don't want to put words in Ben's mouth, but I don't think he has that confidence, particularly as a young person. Well, look, I mean, last year was a very, very difficult year for the country. Um, driven by uh, Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine principally, but also by the rising inflation that that uh, stoked. Um, and it's been a difficult time for the country last year, a difficult time for the Conservative Party last year as well. Uh, Rishi Sunak has been getting on with the job uh, this year, uh, delivering competent, uh, high-quality government and real deliverables, like delivering the Windsor Framework in Northern Ireland, delivering the Australia-US uh, Defence Alliance, joining the CPTPP Free Trade Area. You know, all of these things are very well-received budget, you know, has actually been getting on with competent delivery in government. That is the hallmark of a Rishi Sunak government. You say it competently delivered, well, it was competently delivered by Jeremy Hunt, but you look at some of the measures in it, and, for example, there's been a lot of comment over the weekend, and I think at this business summit today that the Prime Minister was holding, about the fact that uh, this tourism tax has been introduced, which makes us uncompetitive. We've got a tax burden in this country, the highest ever since the Second World War, and that's after 13 years of a Conservative government. Yeah, but, but that, as we know, Ian... Uh, a lot of that has been driven by the pandemic and the amount of money that had to be borrowed during the pandemic, which, by the way, I think most people in Britain think the government overall took the right decisions, the right decisions to support people in their employment, the right decisions to support businesses and make sure that there weren't uh, mass redundancies that could have happened, uh, the furlough scheme, all of these things uh, that the government uh, supported. Uh, that is one of the reasons why uh, the deficit grew and debt grew, but we're getting to grips with that now. We're closing uh, uh, the gap in public finances and uh, moving forward to a much more sustainable uh, position, which is exactly what people expect a Conservative government to do. Don't forget it was Labour who said that there was no money left when they left us that uh, note uh, 13 years ago. It's the Conservative Conservatives who've gotten on with uh, closing that gap, making sure our public finances return to being a sustainable position. Ben, quick, come back from you. I mean, you talk about sort of the um, that letter, but that, that was a Treasury tradition dating back to Winston Churchill, was it not? 
And you sort of talk about the state that the country's in, but this country's in a much better state in 2010. I mean, the pound was at um, 30 um, cents high compared to the dollar. And the debt was um, 69% in 2010 um, compared to 100% as a percentage of GDP. The inflation rate was at 3.5%, whereas now it's at 10%. The credit rate okay, was okay. at AAA. All right. All right. OK, Ben, we get we, we get the point. It's a, a, a long list there. Thank you very much indeed for your question. Uh, we'll take more of your calls in a moment. 0345 973 It's 7.31 on LBC. Time for the news headlines with Amelia Cox. A small number of British troops are in Sudan to look at how British nationals can be evacuated from the country. Foreign Minister Andrew Mitchell has told MPs the situation there is extremely grave. David Lammy has told LBC there can never be a hierarchy of racism following comments made by Diane Abbott. The MP for Hackney North and Stoke Newington has apologised for claiming Jewish, Irish and traveller people don't face racism. And the Health Secretary is taking legal action against the Royal College of Nursing over its strikes next month. Steve Barclay says the NHS believes the action is unlawful, but the union has described the move as wrong and indefensible. LBC weather, rain clearing in the southeast to leave a dry and mostly clear night for much of the UK. Wintry showers for the far north of Scotland, a cold night with lows of minus four degrees. This is LBC. Seven thirty-five on LBC. Greg Hans, the chairman of the Conservative Party, is with me. Uh, he's MP for Chelsea and Fulham. He's taking your calls. Some quite challenging ones so far. Uh, let's go to David in Enfield. Hello, David. Uh, good evening, Greg. Um, why is good evening, David. Shortage? Good evening. Why is the housing shortage and current rental crisis missing from Rishi Sunak's five main election pledges? 
Well, thanks, David. Well, obviously, five pledges, you can't include everything in five pledges. Uh, but housing is a big priority uh, for the government, uh, delivering uh, more housing whilst being consistent with things like uh, protecting our green belt and making sure we have a robust planning system. So housing uh, is a big priority. We've just been introducing um, new measures to, for example, defend uh, social housing tenants, uh, better protection for housing association tenants. There's a lot of uh, measures that have been put in place there uh, under Michael Gove at uh, the Department for Housing Leveling Up in Communities. So there's a lot of good work going on. Uh, we'd actually like to see more homes delivered in London, but Sadiq Khan, uh, as the Prime Minister said, a PMQs last week. Sadiq Khan's got a terrible record uh, in London, including Enfield, on delivering more homes. So we'd like to see more homes in London. We'd like to see the mayor stepping up to stepping up as well. If new house building is such a priority, why has Michael Gove, the housing secretary, abolished all targets for local authorities? Because well, it just gives them the excuse not to build any. Well, it's not always through targets that you'll achieve things. Well, why introduce them in the first place? And uh, I think the what we're trying to do is to make sure that the 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 the, 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 the everything is in, all the everything that you need for more homes to be in place. So a good planning system, a good government support, uh, making sure that local authority leaders are on side. That's uh, for example, we go back to David and Enfield. That's why you know the the role of the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, I think, is uh, quite weak in all of this. So we need to make sure that local authority leaders, uh, elected mayor. Uh, for example, next year we'll have a chance to get rid of Sadiq Khan, which I think uh, people like David and Enfield might I, want to I, see. I should somebody. remind you, there are no local elections in London this year. The, but next year, for next the mayor year, of fine. London, of course. Um, but it, it still baffled me when he abolished these targets, because that there are some shall we say, rural councils throughout the country whose residents just don't want any house building at all, the, the, the so-called NIMBYs. Now, you can understand it if you've got a nice green field at the end of your back garden. Why would you want a, a development there? But if houses aren't built in those areas, we're never going to get to a point where David's children or grandchildren can have access to housing, which, I mean, you, you and I did when we were younger. Well, house building, house building is picking up. It obviously, again, took a hit during the pandemic. And the government is uh, making sure um, through different measures that house building is being picked up as well. But we also need local authorities to play their role. And that'll be a key backdrop to next week's local elections. Or one of the key issues is going to be uh, who is pledged to deliver better, more local homes. OK, David, thank you. Let's move on to Cam, who's in Nuneaton. Uh, key electoral battleground, Nuneaton. Hello, Cam. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask, um, how does a 13-year-old letter have any relevance to today's like, challenges? And if we were to go off figures, they speak for themselves. Um, and is it not drawing any more attention to the failure of the last 13 years? You're, you're talking about this Liam Byrne letter again that somebody yeah. else brought up. Yeah, well, I, I, I've actually got the letter with me, Cam. How, why on earth have you got it with you? Because I carry the letter <laughs> quite often. Because it's a very simple letter, and it reminds us of the catastrophe of the last Labour government. When Labour left office, uh, for every £4 they were spending, the government was spending, £1 was borrowed, and people forget that. And they even wrote, Dear Chief Secretary, I'm afraid there is no money. Uh, signed, uh, said, Kind regards and good luck, uh, Liam. And I think it shows that people still remember this letter. And people, I think for most people, it shows uh, the danger of electing a Labour government that would joke. lose control of the it public. It was a joke, government. wasn't it? Come on. Well, uh, but people, uh, I think for most people at the time, it didn't feel like a joke. If you'd left the public finances where one pound in every four okay. you were spending was being yeah. borrowed. But if you look back at 2010, uh, the public sector debt was around £900 billion. Pounds. What is it now? Well, OK, but we inherited what, what a big deficit. Now? I don't know what it is. The 2.2 trillion. But, but deficit, obviously deficits create debt. And the deficit at that time was a massive deficit. I said one pound in every four the government mm. was spending was being borrowed. That is obviously a big deficit. We got it. Uh, we did a very, very good job over the years going into the pandemic. 
It obviously rose again during the pandemic. That is why we're getting it back under control. But what with the Labour government, every Labour government is always terrible for the country's public finances over many, many decades. But and you, that is you, the danger. You can't possibly maintain, though, that this government over the last 13 years has been good for the public finances. Now, uh, I accept that obviously COVID in the pandemic, there was a huge need to bail the economy out and, and it was the right thing to do. But even before that, the level of public debt was far in excess of what there had been under but, Labour. But that was due to the deficit inherited, Ian, uh, uh, that was inherited in 2010. Going back to uh, the point where one pound in every four was being borrowed, of course, it took a while to close that deficit. And we did a very good job in those years, uh, 2010, particularly up to about 2017. The pandemic came along. That obviously threw things off again. But that is why the deficit and the debt, reducing debt, is one of Rishi Sunak's uh, five priorities. That is what the government is getting to grips with. The budget uh, showed uh, a, a return to uh, sound public finances. That's what we continue to work on. But people shouldn't forget. Uh, what the last Labour government did to the country in terms of the, the inheritance they gave. Literally, there was no money left. Um, I don't know why, but we haven't got a single woman on the switchboard tonight. I don't know what, what that says, Craig. <laughs> Probably best not to speak. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but um, ladies of the United Kingdom, come on, pull your weight. 0345 6060 973. Steve is in Chelmsford, second caller from Chelmsford. Hello, Steve. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'd like to know um, how are you going to make the... Uh streets of England and Wales safer and fix policing when, in effect, since 2010, you've decimated the service? Well, uh, OK, Steve, thank you for that. Well, first of all, we launched our antisocial behaviour plan just a couple of weeks ago, the Prime Minister with the Home Secretary, Sir Le Bravman. In terms of police, uh, there are more police uh, coming through. Uh, we're on our way to meeting the police target um, and the number of police is rising all the time. Uh, that, I think, is a really, really important Was part it a mistake to cut 20,000 police officers back in the early part of the last But we're decade. now uh, close to a position, Ian, where there's record I know, of police I know officers that. in London. I know that. Numbers. That's not the question I asked, though. What, was it a well, mistake in crime, hindsight to have done crime it? Crime had been falling, it was falling uh, during those years. Uh, we've now put more police officers in place, uh, particularly to deal with uh, some areas of the criminal justice system where there's rising crime, uh, for example, like knife crime. That is why the more officers are going in and that's why we're taking the action we are and also tougher sentences which labor are voting against uh, all the time in terms of our uh, criminal justice bills criminal justice legislation which labor are opposing at every opportunity they get uh, let's go to, and the lib dems I let's go to chris themselves. in tower hamlets hello chris uh hello ian hello greg i'm Hi. a retired i'm a retired secondary school head teacher i was just wondering if you uh, believe as you clearly do that uh, the education system of the country is in such good health. Can you explain why the gap in attainment between the least well-off and the most well-off children in the country has been widening since 2017? Uh, well, the, I think I'd have to look at that, Chris, but I it, it may have, the pandemic may play a role there. Um, I don't know. I don't have that data in front of me. Uh, I do think it has closed, though, overall um, since uh, 2010. Um, but it's something I'd be happily have a look at. I think a lot of the government's uh, schools and education reforms have been very positive overall. Uh, the introduction of free schools and a number of the things that Michael Gove did at the early part of the uh, Conservative tenure in government have been really positive uh, for closing that attainment gap. But you, you don't accept that it's widened since 2017. I'd have to I have mean, a look at that. That may be figures. something to do with the pandemic, I guess, because well, that's what I said. Pe people who don't come from well-off backgrounds would have maybe found it more difficult to access education during that time. Um, Chris, thank you. Uh, let's go to Joanne in Hales Owen. Hello, Joanne. Hello, hello, both. Hi. What would you like to ask, Joanne? To ask, oh, sorry, I was going to ask uh, uh, Greg um, Hans what his favourite Brexit benefit is so far. Uh, well, thanks, Jane. I would say... Joanne. Joanne, sorry, Joanne. Um, I would say is actually on the trade side, having been uh, the trade minister for a long time, uh, being able to have an independent trade policy. I used to go to the EU's uh, trade council meetings when the UK was a member of the European Union, and trade was very much a... Uh, if you like, a uh, what is the 
position of the EU28 and Britain uh, position was not always the same as the EU28 and I used to be the most pro free trade voice around that table and is now able to do free trade deals trade agreements like for example uh, joining the CPTPP free trade area doing trade deals with Australia, with New Zealand, uh, some of the state level agreements we're doing with the United States. That, I would say, has been, uh, if you like, one of my, that's probably my favourite uh, Brexit benefit. But is it a benefit, though? Because the, the agreements that you've mentioned there, I mean, that they will, according to the ONS, have a marginal effect on GDP. Um, we're told that we're losing out on 4% of GDP because of Brexit o over a period of <coughs> years. So what, what do you say to the people who don't have jobs because of that 4% going, or people's standard of living isn't quite as high as it would have been had we not left? Well, there's a huge opportunity. The CPTPP free trade area is obviously today, it's uh, 13 countries around the Pacific Rim, but it's growing all the time. Uh, and the opportunity for the UK, this is a group that is going to set a lot of the trading rules of the future, uh, fast-growing Asian markets, about a half of the, the world's middle class will be in Asia, is already in Asia, I think, at this point. So being able to tap into those markets uh, without having, in the same way the EU operates with, you know, uh, where you've got to pay in, you've got uh, other people having a role in control of your borders. Uh, the CPTPP is purely a free trade area. It's a great opportunity for the UK uh, for us to move forward, as, as, as are the other trade agreements. You know, we've done trade agreements with around 70 countries around the world this is a great thing for the uk to be doing i could go on on this for a long time but uh joanne do you want what's your favorite part of brexit joanne my my favorite part of brexit that there, there isn't one everything's much worse and when greg's mentioned that the cptp didn't we already have trade agreements with nine out of the 11 countries anyway and wasn't the cptp that bad that donald trump didn't even want to join it well, Joanne, uh, it's, it all depends. That's a good question, but it all depends what you put in a trade agreement. So you may already have a trade agreement, say, um, with Japan, uh, but the CPTPP allows you to go quite a bit further in some areas. Uh, for example, on uh, talking sort of deep trade nerd stuff here, but uh, say things like rules of origin. We also went further with Japan on uh, protecting geographic indicators from the UK, further on data and digital provisions, uh, really good for <clears throat> the UK's uh, really important fintech industry. There's a lot of places where we went further with Japan, deeper with Japan than either the EU went or the existing uh, um, free trade agreement between the EU and Japan. Joanne, thank you. Let's move on to uh, Faz, who is in Chingford. Hello, Faz. Hello, again. Thank you for having me on the Hi. show. And thank you, Greg, for coming on the show because OBC is one of those stations you can actually interact. And you said that the top performing recycling councils were actually conservative at the beginning of the interview. Is that all right? Is that what you said? Yes, I think conservative councils deliver a higher rate of recycling uh, than Labour councils. Well, I, I don't know how quick we be, but I actually wasn't lazy. I actually went and Googled it. And guess what? Here's the report. South Australia District Council had the second highest recycling rate at 62.7%. Liberal Democrat. Yeah? Last year, the top four swings was filled by Liberal Democrat led council. Now it's up to six. Now, if you take six out of ten, that makes a Liberal Democrat better. Either you can't do your math or you will not even bother to Google something and came on the major radio show and told something that's totally untrue. Which is it? Well, OK, well, well look, uh, uh, Faz, uh, uh, Conservative councils deliver higher rates of recycling uh, than Labour councils. Uh, that is true. But not Lib Dem. Uh, well, I, I'd have to have a look at where the Lib Dems are. Well, they, they've got four out of the five best-rated councils for recycling. The other is a Conservative-run council. Uh, but Chingford, for example, the Lib Dems aren't competing in Chingford. Chingford is very much a Conservative against Labour battle. So I think for FAS, the... The important thing is the comparison between where the Conservatives are, which is much better on recycling than Labour. To the people, Faz? could you not even bother to Google it? Or what you said? I Googled it, that's all I did. OK, but I said that Conservative councils deliver better recycling than Labour councils. I'm confident of that. 
But you didn't mention the fact that Lib Dems were were up there. And it's a, it's a fair point that he makes. I mean, you did, to be fair to you, say, between Conservative and Labour councils, Conservative are better. But it was sort of sin of omission, I think, that Faz is probably well, uh, But pointing I think out. for the benefit of Faz, for where Faz is, you know, this is essentially a Conservative Labour battleground. Ian Duncan Smith, mm. the, the MP... Well, that, there are no elections in Chingford. Uh, I know there are no elections in Chingford, but next year there will be uh, probably a general election. There'll be the London Mayor contest. Uh, that'll be a straight... Uh, Conservative Labour battle. Um, Oliver in Crawley, final question. Uh, if you could be quick as you can, Oliver, and a quick answer from uh, Greg as well. Hi there. Uh, thank you for taking the call. I just want to ask a quick question. So, Greg, you keep mentioning that we've had so much money put into uh, society and the country trying to provide for us through COVID and times before that. But how can you expect for us to vote for you in this upcoming election next year? Um, if you've cut the amount of police officers we have, the amount of nurses, the amount of doctors, and then you've essentially hired the same amount back as a plaster putting over a cut and saying that you've hired more okay. and you've essentially just repaired the damage you've done. Well, I, I mean, I, I just disagree, Oliver, with that. Um, um, as I say, um, uh, police officers are hitting a high in London, or soon hit a high across the country. Uh, doctors, nurses going up, increased investment going into the NHS uh, would inevitably lead, I think, to better outcomes, uh, as well as dealing with the, the five priorities, which includes reducing hospital waiting lists. Oliver, thank you very much indeed. And Greg Hans, thank you for thank talking you. to us over the past 50 minutes. Uh, we have cross-question coming up at 8. Let me just tell you who's on the panel tonight. We have Harriet Baldwin, Conservative MP for West Worcestershire. She she chairs the Treasury Select Committee. Dave Dugan is SMP Defence Spokesperson and MP for Angus. Giles Kenningham, founder of Trafalgar Strategy, former head of press for David Cameron. And John Elledge, freelance journalist, who's the author of the book Conspiracy, A History... Now, can you say, I can't say this word. You put it on my list here and I can't say it. Should we say A History of Grolock's Theories and How Not to Fall for Them? We, we had hoped to be joined by Shami Chakrabarti tonight, but um, uh, she's had to pull out. I'm sure it's got nothing to do with the Diane Abbott story whatsoever. 7.52. LBC.
Uh, five two eight on LBC. Uh, Rebecca in Somerset says, "Ian, I've never made uh, so many comments to LBC in my life. Here's my last. If I lived anywhere near Tunbridge Wells, I would now come and help your partner cook your dinner. You deserve." <laughs> I'm quite sure what to make of that. Anyway, before we come to tonight's cross-question, and do get your calls in for cross-question. I think you've all been obsessed by calling Greg Hands. We do need calls for cross-question as well. The lines are open. You will get through 0345 6060 973. Anyway, before that, let's hear a little of the latest episode of the For The Many podcast. A few hours before Jackie Smith and I sat down to record this week's episode, Dominic Raab resigned from being Deputy Prime Minister after a report upheld two complaints of bullying against him. And this is Jackie's view on the time it took the Prime Minister to decide that his deputy did have to go. Given Rishi Sunak had taken pretty swift action when he received the information about Nadim Zahawi, I thought to myself, if this is bang to rights, um, Rob is guilty of bullying, then he would have fired him by now. Um, yeah. And if it isn't, and given Rob's probably being the most loyal supporter of Rishi Sunak of almost anybody, um, he will. He might try and find a way to keep him. And I wondered if that was what he was thinking about and actually had come to the conclusion by this morning that actually it was a more binary choice than that. Rob either stayed or he went and essentially he resigned before he was pushed um yeah i i suspect what happened i have i don't know this i haven't spoken to anyone who would know so this is just me speculating i think what might have happened is rishi sunak might have rang him up last night and said you do know this is quite bad don't you um i'm going to give you overnight to decide what you'd like to do and now obviously that left sunak open to criticism that well he should have taken decisive action and fired him um, and I thought Keir Starmer was pretty fatuous on his response today. I mean, he's gone within, well, well within 24 hours of the report coming out. I think it was entirely right for the Prime Minister to um, read the whole thing, not just rely on an executive summary. And given what we know, as I say, I haven't read it, but given what I've heard about it, um, I don't think there was any alternative but for him to go one way or the other. Now, he's obviously, well, and we'll come on to this, yeah, yeah. Um, come out fighting and made all sorts of different points about it, uh, which some of which I think are more valid than others. Um, but the, the end result is that the, the Deputy Prime Minister of this country has resigned, which is a massive political development, and it would be in any country. Um, no, I agree, and has, has led to a slightly underwhelming... 